<clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Really glad to be back with everyone here and all of the listeners that have been joining us um, over these months. And um, I wanted to start by um, just sharing a little bit about our intention for what we're doing here. And then Randine's going to introduce our topic. Um, ultimately, what we're attempting to do is invite a new way of being together. This is not a bunch of practitioners talking about stuff, although there's, of course, content. But it's an invitation to look at how we might discover together in a new way, in a way that foregrounds the, the unknown, in a way that accentuates some sort of mysterious creative potential that occurs between us and has been occurring between us for as long as there's been an us. But what we're trying to do here is put some sort of a conscious heart and a conscious mind on the process to see how that might influence this, this becoming together that we're wanting to explore. And so I want to invite the listeners to notice that there's the content aspect. We will have a topic. There will be things said around the topic. But then there's also a process aspect. How are we having the dialogue? Because the, the, the conversational practices that we have as human beings are often invisible to us, and yet they really um, lean us in certain directions. For example, we could be having a debate, and that would lead us into a completely different kind of exploration. But this is different, where we're trying to learn how to lean into each other and lean into a creative space in between us to see what arises. And the last thing that I want to say is exploring in this way goes beyond us saying things and doing this on YouTube or um, somewhere on the internet and you listening. But this invites a new possibility for how we can be in the treatment room, how we can be at the dinner table, how we can be with our neighbors, where there is a bringing forward of a certain kind of luminosity and curiosity that there's a conscious invitation for us to discover together what we don't know and to be surprised, to be surprised in our relationships with one another. So that's that's my invitation for us this evening. And um, Randine, I'll hand it to you. Thanks, Alexander. Um, this is most definitely going to be an exploration. <laughs> We're going to be speaking about death, and you know, there's there's so much to say about what death is, like it's about the the portal between realms. But there's a lot more that that can't be said. So I really look forward to how we can expand into this together. So just you know, some things to get us on track. Um, it's really understood that the passageway into death, like that of birth, involves a gestational process of its own. It's like a, a ripening into what's next. So if we, if we look at death and take it out of its present, like medicalized state, maybe death itself can teach us how to live better. Perhaps death can be a practice, a philosophy, where preparing for one's death makes one's life actually more worthy. And maybe we can come to discover right now on this gathering what it is that dies and what it is that doesn't die. So if we, if we don't refer to anything that we've been taught by others about it, what is death? It's 
definitely an invitation to flirt with the mystery and peer through the veil into the great unknown. Maybe an invitation to see in the dark. So here we enter the realm that we could call the, the valley spirit or the mysterious feminine who spins the forces that allows entrance into, out of, and in between worlds. So besides the biggies, the big entrance and exit points of birth and death, she has other access points as well like the quiet spaces between our thoughts right now and between breaths. Each heartbeat, each blink of the eye can be a portal to the quantum field where we continuously flicker in and out of existence. So if we can kind of expand these mini passages and actually enter into them. What do we find? What is it that comes and goes? And what doesn't? What is the awareing presence that quietly observes? And can it die? And from here, what is, what is death? What is birth? What is rebirth? And what are we invited to ripen into? So what would change in our lives maybe if we didn't resist but embrace this topic of death? What if we could enter into the, the death portal fully conscious all day long? Super conscious, in fact. And so I'm curious really to, to share what can our medicine bring into the dying process? What can we, what can we offer the process of dying? And then what can the process of dying offer us in return? If we can just enter into that space together, I'm interested to hear what you all have to share. I think it's a fabulous topic uh, and so relevant, I feel like, not just for us as people who are in the healing profession, but um, also on some level with, you know, the foundations of the medicine, which is Chinese culture in general, because this is the big yin and yang of Chinese culture, I find we are going into the year of the dragon which is sort of a double new year celebration uh i think in the day after tomorrow the year of the wood dragon starts and wood is spring is life is birth and the dragon is uh symbolic for the third months of spring so we've got sort of double teenage energy and double life celebratory energy and i think all of us particularly the older we are, we're getting sort of an infusion of this dragon chi life force uh, from a temporal perspective this coming year. Um, and during every Chinese New Year's, there is that 
celebration of the return of spring, the celebration of the rebirth, the enormous quantities of food, the dragon dances, whether it's the year of the dragon or not. And so there is that, the celebration of that, right? Um, I think in the Liji somewhere in the, the Book of Rites, it says, uh, Confucius says, yin uh, nu, the food and sex, that's what everybody is most, loves the most. I think there's even a Taiwanese movie about this called yin nu, food. It's mostly about food. There is no, not much uh, uh, sex in there, but it's, 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 it's a love story uh, among older people, actually. Um, and then what people hate the most is the quote continues is death and poverty. And so that's one side of that is this almost super, like I come from a German culture where people, particularly after living through two world wars, everybody likes to almost cynically make uh, jokes about the worst thing that might happen or so and and in chinese culture is absolutely t taboo you can't say oh oh you're traveling tomorrow well be careful that the plane doesn't fall down or let's hope that you know that's already oh my god don't 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 say that because then you might actually increase the likelihood of that happening whereas uh as a i don't know ironic uh cynicism german <laughs> proof german you you on that that sort of part of that that humor but on the other hand like lonnie was saying already in the the you know you mentioned before we turned on the recording you just came from a uh, tibetan monastery retreat in new york state and you were surrounded by images of happy skeletons etc that's the other side that's the yin side that of chinese culture that um in that not just as a sinologist but that as a chinese medicine practitioner in the process of living and having my dad commit suicide when i was relatively young have my brother who was like a twin to me uh die in his early 40s and then you stand in front of the grave and you just can't fathom that this completely alive younger person than you is now being eaten by worms. And there is just this, this absolute horror of thinking you're going to be in this box one day. But at the same time, it was really, you know, this, this immersion for me in Chinese culture and everything that has to do with it, including the cultivational part which is emphasis is actually less on the postnatal aspects of the spleen and the stomach and the lung that on this, they all on the organ clock, they are in go with the first and the second, and third months of spring, but that the heart, which is the most important organ is starting the transformational part of the year, the transformational part of the day when death is coming into nature. We've talked about that before, that at the summer solstice, we have images of when life is at its fullest, but everything is eating one another and is sacrificing one another and is thereby accepting the concept of death. And then that topic continues all the way down to the other aspects of the heart, which is first months of winter, and uh, where the triple warmer is located and the pericardium where nature is dying and goes into the grave. And so um, this putting together the concept of love and death, uh, which is a kind of both of them have to do with complete surrender of something and then opening up a completely different door and also with the triple warmer which is goes with the right the first months of winter that's when nature is in the grave that's where nothing is moving that where where nature is most inactive the time from parallel to that from nine to eleven at night it's it's the concept of 
non-doing, which is opposite the concept of doing and living and birthing and creating. And I find like all of the the more evolved ones of my teachers uh, and the, the temporary insights I have where I really feel like I'm learning something from the classics. So by reading something, it's always about this right side of the organ clock, about the process of transformation of releasing the life force where instead of keeping body and spirit together, it's about the separation of that and looking at that, like you're looking forward and adopting an attitude like Randine was saying, it's like embracing that instead of being afraid of death, it's like you're looking forward to that, like you're looking forward to a nap or are you looking forward to just complete state of selflessness and some kind of a, a love state in a place where you are completely because to me that's what the triple warmer and the first months of winter is signaling is this you are one you have absolute certainty that you're one with the cosmos and that's really that's the part of chinese culture that is everywhere in the classics and everywhere whether it's buddhism or confucianism or taoism it is basically that's what the classics are they say nobody wants to look at that but it this is really the most important thing if you can overcome the fear of death you you will have a completely like randine was saying you will your quality of life will be significantly higher and if you're thinking about it it's the most one of the most human things like something that i found is that the 12 we have 12 months of the year and we've got 12 organ networks 12 functions that go with us and they are for reasons we did, i don't want to go into here but uh, segmented into three different groups that are of course have an earth and humanity and our animal body our divine body and our humanity emotion body and in that emotion body is uniquely human functions like falling in love. That's, of course, pericardium. But then when it comes to the triple warmer, all of the symbolism there is about the grave. And with that, the human ability, which is different from a stone and a plant and an animal, to know while we alive that one day this is all over and we 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 have to die and this defines uh, our entire our entire life in a certain way and our actions and so the overcoming the 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 integration of the concept of death and the overcoming of the fear of death is sort of at the heart when i look at uh the little bit I've learned from well, the insights that were meaningful to me in my own process of being afraid of death uh, uh, um, and imagining one day there is nothing left of you and the panic that comes with that um, was that that kind of that that deep wisdom that radiates from that is that it's 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 that's the place where most effort is uh, and the greatest potential for humanity is and the greatest potential of the life force you know, right we want to have more energy how do you get that is not kind of jumping up and down and uh, doing weightlifting, go running and eating more protein but it's having good night's sleep so it's the same thing it's if we are we are spending so much adrenaline worrying about death that if we let go of that, then there is this this enormous freedom, I think, that can come from that. So I'm talking more theoretically here as somebody who's read these texts. I'm mostly still somebody who's deathly afraid of afraid of death and my own demise, but it's it's it is uh, something that I find very intriguing about Chinese culture is that it's so into life and food and 
on one side and on, on, on the other side, though, there is this very deep uh, embracing from different perspectives of, of the concept of death, you know, including Tibetan monks uh, on purpose going on the right onto the charnel grounds and blowing the skeleton flute or so and inviting in the middle of the night uh, the go hungry ghosts to come and feed on your flesh or so it's everybody's worst nightmare but if you can do that how uh, nothing uh, what else is there to be afraid of but yeah good yeah. to see you all again today yeah yeah i mean i mean in in my own experience you know my, i mean and i'm sure this is not personal but there's a relationship in terms of just different stages of life relative to life and relative to relationship to death and i think that in terms of transformation of jing 50 years old is the age where if somebody's paying attention, they really have to give up the illusion of having infinite time left to get to the important things. And by 60 years old, in my own experience, there's sort of a top-down view of the self I spent my whole life building and seeing through it and actively participating. And now I'm 65 and, you know, it, it might take another 20 or 30 years, but I'm dying. And I can see through the life that I built and the self I became, and I'm actively taking it apart, playing a creative, sort of in creative relationship to deconstructing the self which is death. And as Heiner mentioned last week, I went to a Buddhist monastery where I go every year and I just rent a room and I go to their temple, which is empty because there are only five people living on the 500 acre campus in the winter. And it's desolate, covered with snow with just Buddhas out in the snow and they have a beautiful temple. And I just sit eight to 10 hours a day. And this was actually the first, this is about my 23rd retreat. And it's the first one I ever done where I was, I just sat down and my attitude was there's nowhere else I'd rather be. There's no, there's nothing I'd rather be doing. This is forever. And I close my eyes and I just drop everything. And usually it's like, cause I, I'm doing four or five, two hours sits a day. At some point the mind starts going, God, that did I set my iPhone? The timer hasn't gone off. You know, I've been here for a while. This was the first retreat that didn't happen where I just sat there and said, okay, I could never play guitar again, never see a camera again, never see my kids again, never see my wife again. This is it. And able to just absolutely let go. And um, instead of battling the mind or being victimized by whatever was coming up, just to actually really have no preference and to just be interested and let go. And in my experience, the the mind or whatever was going on there was just way, way, way in the background. And even though they were four or five, two hour sits, I was always surprised when the clock went off. And there's sort of a active creative engagement. Um, I mean, I've seen time and time again in my own experience that the most essential part of us doesn't die it wasn't born nothing happened there nothing is happening there nothing's ever going to happen there and there's a mystery and um it it's there's a mystery beyond the mind and there's there's luminosity and like a fire burning an emptiness. And beyond that, there's just, I don't know what there is, but my overall sense is in a positivity and an interest. And of course the ego, oh, the ego's position is always, I want more time. That's the ego's fundamental position. I want more time. But I think as, as, as we, um, cultivate and we have experiences and look deeply into them we see through time 
we see through time into a a timelessness and a spacious spaciousness. And for me, I just come to have faith in the whole process, which doesn't mean that my ego, uh, you know, won't be um, concerned or doesn't get scared to death. It sure doesn't like being on a chairlift 75 feet high, 400 feet above tree line and having the chairlift stop when the wind's going 40 miles an hour. So there's, so <laughs> there's some part of me which... Um, will still reacts in that way, but in a very, very deep sense. I mean, it's been my clinical experience, just to end here on a clinical note. I did a lot of work in the 80s and the early, up till about 95 with people dying of, with people who had HIV dying of AIDS before there was any cure. And I ran a free clinic for many of those years where anyone with HIV could come and I would, when it got near the end, I would go to their house and treat them six, seven days a week, the last two months of their life. And what I would see in almost all of them was that as the body dropped away, the presence became more and more holy, more and more divine. And I saw people, a, a gay, you know, these were gay, mostly gay guys, and one gay guy who had been thrown out of his house as a teenager, abandoned by his, I saw him like call, pay for his mother to fly up from South America and completely forgive her. And just some of these people became like saints. So as the material form was let go of more and more, there was a kind of divinity and spark that came out, which was deeply inspiring and very beautiful. And I think the, lesson that I've most learned from death leading off of what Randine said is just gratitude that you know I have this moment and, and I still have a body and I can still act and while I have a body and I can still act it's going to be for the true the good the beautiful and it, it's gonna and I'm gonna give and the Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva vow tells us well eventually you're gonna have to give everything up so why not dedicate it all now to the well-being of all, all who suffer? And so, well, I've been scared, like Heiner said, you know, as we all are, most of my life of death, more and more it's, I don't think it's a problem and it's becoming more creatively interesting. And if you don't want to be eaten by worms, Heiner, the Hindus have a good solution for that. <laughs> what is that solution <laughs> cremation oh cremation i see okay <laughs> so what i'm what i'm hearing and curious about is there's this what i'm hearing is the question of what what dies what doesn't die what's our relationship to that process and i'm wondering sort of how we feel that now as we lean into each other. What does it take for us, including the listeners, to touch into that place that doesn't die, to touch into that place that requires some sort of um, departure from the norms of our current identity. And I'm wondering what happens if we all lean into that and let that speak us.
There's a, go with. There's, a, there's a depletion in the population, the explosion of death in the population as we speak. And it's increasing and will probably explode um, in the not too distant future. But um, given that, my teachers have told me that um, in the not too distant future, there will be fewer wombs by which people who desire the experience of this type of a planet can uh, acquire access. And so the, 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 the vital need to really handle what it is that we're here to handle, understand what we're doing here, and, and accomplish that work. I, I, Lonnie, I believe you're there. Uh, I mean, I don't know. But in any regard, uh, that expression is an example, perfect example. Um, and so to this end, within the discipline of the field of energy arise, uh, there needs to be a refined set of competencies for those people who become educated in this discipline around the matters of dying and death. In the shamanic traditions, of course, and ritual traditions, death is often a portion. And, and I've had the experience of my body being pecked away at by animals and birds and bones left. Or maybe the privilege of a rainbow body experience in these moments. But the privilege of having a body which can die is an extraordinary moment and a precious moment. And I seek also that privilege of the conscious transition in that moment that that the grace that, that can be extracted and penetrated through that moment through self and through the collective surrounding that self as a whole as a resonant field of experience has the opportunity of a fully awakened presence and in that moment a gratitude for that passing into the realm consciously through the privilege of conscious dying through the rose of the shamanic moment of departure, having passed along the gifts of the lifetime, let them go, even letting go of that which is the recurrence of that soul's presence in the minds of the people around them, following the departure, and how that emerges has the potential of blessing ancestors forward and backwards and, and that would be my my prayer that my prayer that those those beings are are healed and awakened and become that which they are here to serve Seems like there's something, Will, in what you're saying around um, that that poignancy of recognizing the inevitable withering of this precious gift. That, when taken seriously, begs the question: What the hell should I be focused on? 
<laughs> and it reminds me of what Heiner was speaking to around. I forget what he said, but it was something about death and love and 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 something about when we're brought face to face with the inevitability of departure it begs the question well where where do we go from here and what the hell should i do about remaining here for the duration because i think there's there's often a, a feeling of i need to fill up this life and often a forgetfulness I experience a forgetfulness at various times that I'm also preparing for something that is a much longer journey. And that certainly shifts prioritization around mm -hmm. what matters and where our attention and our heart um, truly wishes to lean towards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is a shift from being an ego to a soul, which which we've talked about a few times over the course of our dialogues, which is, you know, the ego has a one life view. And the soul understands that every significant choice we make is not just for ourselves, but it impacts the whole and impacts the past the whole past ancestry and ancestors are progeny going forward for as many generations and that the significant choices we make have implications that are timeless and and not just not implications for just this life and how this ego is going to be affected and to playing out in terms of its fears and desires but a very, very deep time view I have. I so often have patients or students who come to me with some dilemma about an action they took that didn't play out the way they thought it was going to or hoped that it would. And I, was, I said, you know, I've practiced medicine 40 years. I've, I've made choices in the late 80s that people called me three years ago and told me had finally played out in their life. And sometimes it takes decades and sometimes it takes lifetimes and lifetimes. And I, I think as we become souls, there's just, at least that's how I interpreted what, how I, what came up for me when you were speaking, Alexandra, is just making the shift from being an ego with a single life focus to being a soul on a journey. And having utter confidence, not that everything's going to be okay, in the ego sense of I'm going to be happy and healthy and everything's going to go well, but that fundamentally from the soul's perspective, the destination is toward origin, toward, toward light, and the path and the goal are one, and it's here right now. And it's never anywhere else at any other time. And, you know, I just just to conclude, I mean, I might have told the story in these dialogues, I don't know, but it's true that one of the first books I, I ever read of a spiritual nature was the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And I was like 14 and I did not, the, the translation stinks and I didn't really, the, I can't, was it Evans once? I can't remember who translated it, but it was terrible translation. And the only thing I got from the book is when you die, go toward the white light. And I thought to, I felt a total sense of relief as a 14 year old, like how easy is that? I do whatever I want during life. And when I die, go toward the white light. And of course, once you start getting some authentic experience, you know, I eventually realized, well, when I die, I'm going to keep doing exactly what I've been doing for the same reasons I've been doing it. And I'm not going to go toward the white light then any more than I'm going toward it right here and right now and giving myself to it wholeheartedly right here and right now. And, and that, I think, was a big insight 
that was just the big difference on this meditation retreat is, okay, death is, you sit on the pillow, close your eyes, that's it, I'm dead. And, and let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. And what you've, and what my big insight from this retreat is that letting go is love. That when, the more we let go of what takes its place is light and love. Oh, I'm, I'm called to um, bring voice really what is essentially silence. And I, um, I have to say, I've been really appreciating. I mean, Randy knew. You threw this topic out a couple months ago when we were talking. <laughs> it's like, okay, are we ready to take death on? <laughs> but what I mean, just that we're doing this together feels like an incredible blessing. You know, just that we're to sit together like this in the presence of, you know, the greatest mystery that we'll ever encounter. And that none of us have encountered, at least in this incarnation. So we're all kind of sitting here in the dark, literally. <laughs> so I've been really just appreciating that, that we're just, that, you know, you, that we've, come to this together. And I've been really appreciating the silences and, you know, what everyone's sharing. What keeps coming to me is interesting because, you know, I heard you say, Lonnie, that the ego wants more time. And I'm kind of an interesting response to that because um, I get that, of course. I mean, the ego is like the let, you know, the ego is going to be like, that's the whole issue, basically, I think, is that the ego and death are like, you know, it's, it's just isn't working out very well on the planet right now. But, but it's also, you know, it's interesting because for me, I keep coming to that the soul or at least for me, um, and really as I come closer and closer to, or coming closer and closer to realizing that I, that the time does begin to dwindle and essences do transform, that the holding is connection that the holding on isn't so much the ego for me anymore. I don't, I mean, not to say that I don't have an ego, man, I do, but, um, but the holding place feels more around a kind of, it's interesting because for me, it feels like this soul connection to the beings that I love so deeply. And that's where I feel like my work right now is here in my relationship to the letting go. Uh, like this, and it's interesting, Heiner, that you were speaking of the heart because for me, it does feel like a heart, it says something to do with how the heart connects to other hearts. And that the dying, so where I'm really in my own process here is that if you, if you go deep enough into that heart connection and the painfulness of, you know, the, the, 
I mean, I'm going to be very granular here. You know, it comes down to like sitting with my grandchildren, you know, and going, oh, I'm going to leave these. I'm going to somehow leave these like amazing beings of Shen, you know, that 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 it's that I wouldn't be able to keep playing in this Shen bath with these beings that it's just like pure freaking joy that and and you know so then like today I was talking to my granddaughter and she's like I love you I love you Gammy Gammy guess what I love you and we're like I love you this much and I love you more than all the pancakes that were ever made in the world. And I love you. She, I, she goes, I love you more than every galaxy that will ever be. And I guess as I'm sitting in this conversation, what I'm getting is that to open to that much loving is the only way through this, like that your heart's going to crash into a hundred million trillion pieces and that somehow, like a lot of you're saying, like somehow that's going to be all right, you know, <laughs> that somehow there's so much love that's going to pour through that you can stand leaving these beings that you love so much. So I guess it is beginning to, as we're sitting with this for me, I'm like, okay, love really, it's kind of like when you're giving birth, you know, and it's like you're right at that moment where you're like, I can't. I cannot push this thing out of me. I can't. I can't. And then it and then like I remember going, oh, okay, I get it. The only way through this, the only way out of this is through this. And Randy, and I guess that comes back to, you know, the pieces that you're putting together about birth and death having a certain kind of beautiful parallel. Um elegance in their relationship. I think I just got that very viscerally. Oh, I love that focus on surrendering to the love because that is ultimately, you know, it's ultimately why we're here. It's ultimately why we have difficulty with leaving. And I think about my own relationship with death, not personally, but my relationship with those that have passed, my being present with those that are passing and, and feeling, experiencing the expansion of the soul for something that transcends the body, that transcends the ego, that opens us up to something that is so beyond even the human heart where there's something where it's, I, I can't quite get there because I'm in this thing. But it, but there's a longing so great for it that is only accessed at those magical and impossible moments where the only thing to do is to surrender and to somehow go through the eye of the needle where something else takes you over. And I think about you know, I think about the hun and the role of the hun. And the hun is in time, but the hun itself is is eternal and follows the shin. And the the expansion of the hun out of this existence, it first has to find meaning of a life well lived before it can find its way onward. And I always think too about the I think it was Claude Lahr that talked about Hun communication and how Hun can communicate without, you know, without the blathering words, basically. <laughs> and so I think about that, the, the eternal expansion of the soul when I think about death and I think about the, the portal into death the portal into life, you know, what it, What are we birthing into? What is the next that we can open up to, that we can ripen into? And I, you know, I have done a lot of work and research and programming on 
how Chinese medicine can be with those that are dying and how Western medicine can kind of get in the way of those that are dying with the process of the hun that can be hindered through narcotics because it damages the liver, it fragments the soul and the soul wanders and, the, and doesn't know the what's next because it's never practiced in life. So that's why I wanna call that out, that what next, that what's, what's beyond right now, right here. Kind of like a interesting thing because my, my sense of it is that there's a need to let go of everything in order to feel that beyond human, beyond this cosmos kind of love that seems to have some kind of recognition in it that complete surrender one would become that and and then one is still the grandchildren which is weird because i mean you know at another level it's like i at, at another dimension of it i i feel just what you mean lori where it's like i don't want to leave my baby girl who's 14 and you know i i so there's like there's that and and then there's also this this feeling of this love that is not from here it is for, it, but it is everything here but it's like that it's that kind of like um it's like it breaks through the walls of here when when there's enough of of paying attention but 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 then there's that place of dying enough while living that more of the full body of whatever it is that's beyond the, that veil sort of makes itself known as some sort of more essential fabric. And then it's like, oh, like, it's like the grandchildren are like the toenail on the octopus tentacle thing and like we're that whole thing and and yet, I, it's like even to use that imagery completely, it's like, yes, it conveys something in symbol, but completely fails in, in, in the direct recognition of how beyond human this love is and how it's pouring through everything. Saying, you know, to die is, is to be able to somehow have the soul recognize its true nature as this. As a, as a portal of light. Yeah. I mean, Laurie, what you were pointing to is like the love and the care is like while you were talking, like the love and the care is so much that it's actually, it trans, as Alexander, I think was saying, it actually, we can see at a point that it points to a love that has no object. And that the, the call of that, that is love absolute. And in the face of love absolute, it illuminates, in my experience, every part of myself that, you know, of course, we want love, and we love this, and we love that, and love is good. And in the face of the call of love, the absolute demand of love absolute, I've become aware of every part of myself that pulls back from that. Every part of myself that, because it's just too much. It's just too much. And, you know, people come to us because they... And we all have looked in our own lives to mend our broken hearts and people come wanting their broken hearts to mend. And what I've just seen is 
Wholeness means living with a broken heart. And it's that break in the heart where we actually have the capacity. Well, at least I just decided in my life, I'm going to, regardless of the fact everything's going to have to be let go of, I'm going to embrace it all. And I'm going to love with everything I have, even though it's all going to be let go. It's all going to have to be let go of. And, and so, yeah, so that's the call of the love absolute. And also you said, you know, here we are talking about the greatest mystery, death. Life's just as much a mystery to me. I mean, I don't know that I could say, I mean, here we are and, you know, who's who here has figured this out? I mean, so I think it, it, it's just all part and parcel of the same thing. And I, I do think, at least what I've seen, I've been, so when I was like four or five years old, I had this, uh, I had a series of dreams in a night, maybe I was five or six, very young. And in this dream, I was walking and a skeleton was walking underneath me. And I was running and running and I ran into my house and I slammed the door. And I turned and I was like, I was safe. And then it was at the top of the stairs and it threw a knife and it went into my heart and I gasped. And I was on a merry-go-round going round and round and round and round and round in a circle. And I was terrified my whole early life, you know, sleeping with my head under the, like it, it was more of a transmission than I had the mind to comprehend. And I, I was just absolutely, driven by terror in the way Heiner was speaking about, I, th I think of, of being terrified of, and it's just, the ego is just tiresome. And the, the more we let go, the more we, the, this light, this absolute light is actually, as Alexander said, it, it's just literally coming through everything all the time. It's just, the, it's who and what we are. And I just have seen enough in meditation to have pretty firm conviction that the dependents got it right, which is that when when we die, we just we're just nestled in light and love, and every part of us that wants to remain separate is going to contract from that and then go down through hell realms, which which are the bardos and all these psychological states of attachments, but but we can learn right here and right now. And, and what it takes to meditate well, and I think what it takes to die, although in this life I haven't done that all the way, but it's no different than what this conversation is taking, which is just to drop everything and give to the unknown, to, to just let go. And, and what, what, what emerges when we do that is just this mind-blowing creativity and interest and positivity and the Chinese were pretty clear on this right Heiner in the philosophical text that a person who forgets to die is like a person who has mistaken their home yeah for sure I mean death is about returning home exactly that the term gui for demon, which is uh Right, that the, the soul detaching from the body is is uh, going home, and that's it's a stellar constellation actually, a graveyard in the sky, which is where the sun is in the tropic of Cancer uh, in the fifth lunar months of the year, where the heart is located on the polar map. So the heart is about going home and die before you die. And the Gui, and then, the Gui is the ghost, but it also, the other character Gui means to return. Right, and the, the dictionaries define Bruce. one Gui with the other Gui. And ghost is that which is supposed to return home. But then in the beautiful uh, full spectrum way of uh, symbolism, you've got the pathological ghosts, which are when the ego is so strong that even after the death of the body, the soul refuses to leave the material world and is hovering 
uh, near uh, the body and is haunting uh, the living or so because it does not want to go home. And um, so, yeah, the, 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 the concept of going home and of course heart is all about in the end about it's about death, it's about life, it's about spirit, it, radiance, and it's about love. And uh, we've, um, and and in a certain way, love and death. I think, and all of this is is the same as we've explored here together. And I was struck by Will's comment that it's a special thing to have a to know that there is a body that can die. I, I remembered after you said that, that there are, I forget, Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology. I think every mythology has creatures who are immortal. And that is a life of suffering, not only because there is then multiple layers of suffering. Like my grandmother, when I asked her as a little kid, when she was over 80, would you want to do it again, living through the First World War and the Second World War, et cetera. She said, oh, Gottes Willen, oh, God, no, that 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 would be terrible. But I think the bigger thing is the 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 inability to be or the torture maybe to be fully present because the knowledge that one day that life is short and one day there will, will be in a different dimension is makes us as supposed to theoretically at least make us treasure every second. And that's really what the heart is about. Like there, I remember a poem that said, Chinese poem from the Han Dynasty, where it said, life is like glimpsing a white colt that goes by a hole in the wall in an instant, fleeting instant, it is gone. You know, so it's this kind of brief moment in time. It's also how we learning sitting at the feet of our teachers. It's this we can't learn unless we fully radically present with our hearts open, because otherwise we'll forget later. And um, that's also what Alexander said is this, this, the knowledge of death is making us think what what the hell am I doing here while I'm alive? It's this constant, if there is no death, we will not contemplate that question. And if we're thinking about if we are in love, for instance, it's the one as a teenager when we most attached uh, to being young and living forever, it's the one moment where you say, I could die right now. I think we might even I might have even said that because you feel you feel like everything that is truly important you've already experienced and you catch a glimpse of this this eternity of the soul that is uh, goes way beyond this limited kind of existence or and it's the same sensation when you always wonder right you a speaker at a funeral, and then you're saying all of these things uh, about that are important about this person, about the love that you had for this person, but we should really live a life when, while they are still alive, is to be radically present with that and uh, pour that out. And um, from another perspective, this reminds me of what Lonnie said is, is the less pleasant ex experience of radically living where, because life is not perfect. And this is what we experiencing with the heartbreak of our patients about their lives and about disappointed things and, and about the pain from the disease and the whether it's you know other things they tell us and that we experience ourselves, whether it's not enough money or everything is not going our way, but there is that we I know in those moments when you're holding on to something when you get 75% of what you want, but if you're down to three percent, you you go like, wow, it's it's nothing matters anymore. And it's almost, I mean, that's in a certain way what a monk does or a nun, right? You 
you cut your hair, you give your clothes away, you give all your possessions away, you even burn something into your scalp to make sure you can't back out of it later so your hair will never grow back or so. There is sort of, in a certain way, if you can reach through the back door, so to speak, uh, not through the ecstasy of lo young love, but through the freedom of complete being forced to let everything go, it gets us to the same place. All of these are, in a certain way, little deaths. Die while we die, that gives us a glimpse of the eternity of the soul and 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 the importance of and the eternity of love and light that we are in the end. So, yeah. Hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. I, you know. I, I want to say something that yeah. being conscious of a part of myself that is beyond time and space that somehow knows that somehow knows or prepares things ahead of time that that isn't that isn't tied to my body or my ego that that expansion of myself that maybe you know could tell when a parent was going to die um uh and still feel connected after death to people who have died puts makes me realize that there is no real death that um, I don't know how to explain it. Um, that 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 part of me that knows those things is infinite and and in touch with something beyond this reality, and is very much um, um, how can I say? Um, it, it it's still it, it it's able to sense something beyond this dimension or, or something like that. And I think that takes away some sort of anxiety about death because there's a feeling of infinite spaciousness. I, I describe it as peace, a sense of infinite peace. Um that one can feel and one knows, or one when when that part of us that knows. Uh, and I hate using words because I think words are so limiting. Um, maybe the part of us that feels that infinite connection between generations, prior generations and generations to come of humanity, and and um, is very expansive and connected it, it's the same way sometimes when people have passed and getting messages because one is open to it that one knows that that energy hasn't totally gone away hmm. i don't think i'm making sense but yeah, i think it makes <laughs> I, th I think it makes good sense it ties for me to what laurie was saying too and my own experience, when I was young, my grandmother was the person I was closest to. And when she died, it, it was, you know, the, the two things I've experienced in life that no amount of preparation can prepare you for is birth and death. I always took for granted I was going to have kids. I knew for nine months that my daughter was going to be born. And when they were born nothing could nothing prepared me for looking in their eyes for the first time and i knew i remember being four or five and asking my parents is grandma going to die someday and they say well everybody dies but that's going to be a long time from now and then she died and even though i knew my whole life my grandmother was going to die there's there was something that happened at a soul level in me that no, nothing mentally could have prepared me for. And in fact, part of that was becoming more embodied because the last person who held me as a child was gone because that's the only way she ever saw me was as her little grandson. And my grandmother to me was just a source of radiant joy. And a few years after she died, it was this 
beautiful, beautiful, like 70 degree fall day. And the sun was shining and the, the trees were beautiful. And I stopped and I was hit by this and I realized there's that's my grandmother's smile. It's just, it's just that what I actually loved, that she was just the embodiment of something that wasn't born, didn't die and never goes anywhere. And so I think Vasanti, I mean, that's what came up from, for me when you were talking. And when I heard Laurie talk, when you were talking before about how am I ever going to leave these beings? Uh, there's so much love that I can barely stand it. And, and right there is the question of, in that moment, are you going to die to that love? Right here and right now. Because it's that's the only way to fully grasp the only way to fully experience it is to have no possession of it whatsoever now i really love that you're coming to that in vasanti this kind of circling around because as you were speaking heiner and you know you all know i'm like been passionately interested in the postal and the guay for decades now you know and continue to be and i'm still sorting it out and when you and of course this idea of this these souls as what they're asking for you know the the wandering i mean the first time i heard claude lars speak about the guay and he was like we're not going to call them bad names you know and this was 40 years ago that i heard him give that for and he was like we're not going to call them bad names they're just these bits of she just floating on the air and that little curly cue at the bottom of the character is the dust storms that whirl as they pass us by but that they're asking us what they need is to be helped to return to go to the place where they actually to return home as we're all saying and what i'm very acutely aware of both in my own personal work but on a larger collective level is the that the returning home the grasping of course there's a grasping when home the, the place to return to has not been honored has not been brought forth as sacred you know this returning to what we could say Ziwang Lu, the, the 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 as you were saying, Randine, the the mysterious feminine, this going that the yin, the dissolution, is the place where we're held, where we're where we're safe and we're welcomed you know so so i feel like the grasping uh, of course there's a grasping if the place that you return to isn't has been lost in a certain sense you know and i feel like when in our looking at as you're saying randy and, and we're all sort of saying that we need to that needs to be part of our education as practitioners you know, how do we support ourselves and our patients in recovering that place of return as a place that is that is home, that is safe, that is sacred. So I wanted to just, in a certain sense, honor in, as part of our conversation this this grasping the ones that grasp the parts of us that grasp and to love and care for those as well because they are in claude lard's words what they're asking for is the support to find their way back you know to find their way back i think laurie that's a very important part in where we are handicapped us children of the modern industrial revolution is because that place where we're going home to is nothingness. And uh, everything is about 
scaling up and producing more, having more accumulating stuff uh, in modern cultures, halves, the halves and the halves nots. And that is sort of what I find is most attractive about starting with the Tao Te Ching about the, that the education, that the nothingness is the most precious, is the most powerful. Why did the ancient Chinese orient their houses where even the character for D, for heavenly lord or emperor, emperor was some kind of, according to Hankanir at least, some measuring device or the shape of a measuring device where you would see where is due north because in 2000 BC that was the center of the universe was not where the pole star was, but it was empty. Right. And so that's why the Tao Te Ching then says 20, right? 20, eight spokes in the wheel, but it's the empty center that makes it most valuable, which is symbolic for the 28 stellar constellations with the center of the universe that's empty. And uh, four walls make a room, but it's the empty space that makes it useful. So the Wu Wei, the Tao is empty, you know, returning home to the Tao, and that's a good thing and we feel afraid of that. And uh, so I think that idea that it's the nothingness, that's the the non-space that is sacred space is uh, culturally alien to most of us. So that's that's where the, 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 the classics or real teachers remind us of that or in lucid moments, uh, like when we're talking here, this is another thing I was talking about you know, radicalness of presence. I want to, you know, being in love is one thing or sitting with a dying person another, you fully present. And uh, by, uh, I always think this is not, I'm busy, I have other things to do. And 4.30, I need to hurry to be part of this uh, monthly uh, gathering here. But it's it's always when when it's, happens it's always it reminds me for it it being with you guys it reminds me how i should be at every moment radically present uh and uh so thank you for that i just wanted just i loved what you said heiner and i feel like it brings us full circle because what we're this what we're speaking to is at the heart of the dialogue alexander as you brought us in this different way of being that we're that we're cultivating together is exactly what you're saying heiner it's being in the presence of nothing together But the nothing isn't nothing at all. <laughs> well, it, it reminds me of what you were saying, I think, in the beginning, Randine, this relationship between, you know, what is contemplating death or um, going through the dying process while living? What does that do for living? And, you know, my experience in having to face death of loved ones or having to face things that feel unimaginable to face. The only way that I, I've been able to do that is through the dying process that then illuminates the soul, which is capable of living completely with absolutely no contraction. And so it, it occurs to me that there's that kind of, that relationship between how dying while living makes living not just bearable, but brilliant, where we can face into any, any, any degree of horror with curiosity and nothing but luminosity and and I feel like this this is this 
invitation for our, ourselves and our and our clients and patients to 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 return to that because not only does it help us when we need to transition beyond this world, but it helps us be able to transition through this world in a way that is more profound and, and just practical when it comes to, you know, facing hell in this life. I just don't know any, any better tincture than, than the, than the, the soul. You know, in connection to that, Alexander, that the, that, that hell that people go through, it's, it's the, that life, all the phases of life, all the possible forms of life that, uh, a man or woman, a being on this planet can experience C coming to that moment of death has just as wide a, an array of possibilities that can take place. And pray that we all have courage to face that moment completely awakened to our presence that of course we know there are people who are able to just go and that moment the will the will to leave has has to arrive or does it because then laurie that violence that you were talking about can take place whereby the the soul's ripped from the body with without its consent and how does the soul manage that? I recall in my early 20s, living in Venice, California, we would, De De Las Muertes, around all day saints, we would do rituals to assist the dying, viewing that as a portal. And, and there was an Egyptian mystery school close by, and we would engage with uh, Ma'at, uh, who presided over the Hall of Two Truths, the the soul faces at the moment of their departure, the conscience, their own conscience about their life and what it is that served and what did not serve them and others, and the 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 regrets. Are there regrets? Are there no regrets? I have friends who say no regrets. Well, really, does that moment come? And there's no regrets. We hear reports of nurses in the di in in those words of of the kinds of things that people have regrets about over the course of their life. The Hall of Two Truths. It, there's always a beginning, middle, and end, and so we do know we do know what happens when it, that time comes because we've been there so many times before. Just as just as Arjuna on the battlefield, not wanting to kill his siblings and cousins and so forth. And Krishna is driving the chariot and Krishna says to him, never has there been a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor any of these. This is your destiny, go do it. So, so there's, I mean, there's so much violence and bloodshed on this planet. Right? But not everyone dies of violence and bloodshed. Where the consciousness goes when there's no tether, when the Poe does not bind to the experiences of this planet, depends so heavily upon where, while that that body, that body of, of, of consciousness remains, where is it directed? And it's as simple as that. And there's so many places from absolute nothing to, pre, to that space of pre-cosmos of non-cosmotic being 
the Wuji to two realms of ecstatic beauty, it's still remains the play of mind. Sometimes we become fused that the mind is gone once the body's gone, but we we have the ability to cultivate our presence in, in such a way to keep our attention such that there is creation of a set of possibilities that alters the course of destiny for that of all of our ancestors. And there's no more poignant moment than that. Can I sustain that? Does it happen so quickly that I don't even know it happened? Wandering in some earthly plane, confused. Can I, can I sustain the presencing of consciousness through to that place of healing for those who were and will be. We do uh, sound healing journeys and, and um, when Pluto, God of death, vibratory frequencies, gongs played, or when the pre-cosmotic gongs with no particular frequencies are played, I'll often play the Mayan death whistles. And these are calling forth, right, <clears throat> the potential of the wind to move through these spirits. And um, it, it's actually a joyous moment. Well, it's joyous. Why? Because everyone's going to be getting up and leaving that room, hopefully. But... Um, <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> well, I, I I was teaching with Tenzin Wang Yao and he and another Tibetan monk. And he said, Well, hopefully I'll live this life right and when I die I won't have to come back. And I said, Well, it hasn't been so bad, has it? <laughs> I said, I, I think they, from another perspective, I think, you know, when all sentient matter in the universe recognizes itself as love and light and spirit, we'll just come back and do it all again. And, you know, the commitment is eternal. <laughs> there, there's no, there's, there's no getting, there's no getting out of here because there's nowhere else. It's just only this moment, in what it, whatever form, and and I mean I I that that consciousness that that we experience between us in these talks, that field, on the one on the one hand it's my experience that we are the generators of it that it isn't pre-existing. And on the other hand, it's my experience of there it is, and it's never gone anywhere. And it and it doesn't go anywhere, and it isn't born and it doesn't die, but it it does, it does, as Alexander says, everything transforms. Everything and that transformation, you know, uh from from our perspective, those kind of changes in life. Um we have to die to who we are to become the, the next more integrated self, the next more whole self. And that's a very big part in my experience of, of healing has always been about helping people die because they have to become the kind of people who don't have their problems. <laughs> and that involves a kind of death. Anyway, I think once again, I think we've we've done it. We're we're at just after nine o'clock, and it's beautiful to spend time together. It feels like we could have do a like death part two. 
<laughs> I was thinking, just our topic from now on. Yeah, we just got started. <laughs> yeah, it, seems, it seems like we, we, we scratched the surface here. Hmm. Well, and I think there is further dying that we could go because we all kind of do die into this field together a little bit. And, you know, I, I could certainly use more of that myself. What would it mean to like go, not do it a little bit? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like to just absolutely, <laughs> like really to go all the way. <laughs> well, stay tuned. Next time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn off the recording.